Uh, but today I'm really thrilled uh, and excited to welcome our speaker, Professor Lear Bustan, who is a professor of economics at Princeton University, where she also serves as the director of the industrial relations section. Her research lies at the intersection between economic history and labor economics. And her first book, Competition in the Promised Land, Black Migrants in Northern Cities and Labor Markets, examines the effect of the great black migration from the rural South in the United States during and after the World War II. Her recent work, including her new book, Streets of Bold, America's Untold Story of Immigrant Success, it's co-authored by Rand, Rand Abraminsky, is on the mass migration from Europe to the United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Professor Bustan is also co-director of the development of the American Economy Program at the National Bureau of Economic Research, and she also serves as the co-editor at the American Economic Journal of Applied Economics. She was named an Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellow in 2012 and won the ICA Young, Eco Young Labor Economist Award in 2019. And very recently, she was also elected fellow to the Econometric Society. Uh, very importantly for us, we're welcoming her back to the Harvard campus uh, because it's also one place that you call home when we were doing your PhD in economics here. So we're going to start just here presenting some context setting data points to kind of get us on the same page. And then hopefully we'll have a, a conversation and invite questions from the audience as we go on. So we'll over to you. So I'm really delighted to be able to share some of the findings from my new book, Streets of Gold, here at the Kennedy School. Uh, which in addition to the economics department, the Kennedy School is my alma mater. I was part of the inequality program here when I was in grad school in 2002 and 2003. So I wrote this book with Ron Abraminsky, my longtime collaborator, and we were inspired to write the book because we believe that national conversations about immigration and immigration reform are driven mostly by myths rather than by facts and data. And so we um, set about to share some of our findings uh, to be part of this conversation. <laughs> One of the myths inspired our title, Streets of Gold, this idea that anyone can come to the US with just a few dollars in their pocket and they can quickly make it here. Uh, but the truth is a lot more complex. So I think it's well represented by this quotation. It's painted on the wall of the Ellis Island Museum. Um, and it's attributed to an unnamed Italian migrant saying, I came to America because I heard that the streets were paved with gold. But when I got here, I found out three things. First, the streets were not paved with gold. Second, they were not paved at all. And third, I was expected to pave them. So we asked ourselves, how would American history change if we listened to these millions of unsung migrants, note that this was an unnamed migrant. We never know his full story. So we used data on millions of such immigrant families, both in the past and today, to rebuild what we know about immigration from the ground up. That's our goal. So where do these findings come from? In the historical case, we're using the US census records, um, which become uh, public after 72 years and have been fully digitized. And we can use these to follow an immigrant as he lands in the US and then spends more years in the country over the course of his career. We also can see children living at home with their parents and then follow that child into the labor market. <coughs> so you can think of us like curious grandchildren who are using ancestry.com, the genealogy website. And in fact, that's where we started with our work. And from there, we build algorithms to follow more than just a few family members to really scale this up to thousands and then millions. Uh, what I'm showing you here is one of the census manuscripts, not selected at all at random. This is my grandfather, Matthew Platt, who's circled at the bottom, living at home with his parents, who were immigrants to the country, and his seven other brothers and sisters in the 1920s census. And it turns out that my family's story is very representative of what we find in the broader data. So my great-grandfather, the immigrant generation, never moved up the occupational ladder. And that's something that we see um, a very commonly in both the Ellis Island period and today, that the first generation, the immigrants themselves, move up pretty slowly. So where they start ends up determining what the rest of their trajectory will be. If they start with a lot of skills, and they come already seeking a PhD, then that determines one path. If they start 
coming from a country with less opportunity for education and they're entering into a low skilled profession, then that determines their path. But the second generation, the children of immigrants rise. And you can see this with my family. Uh, the older kids in the family enter into white collar positions in offices or retail jobs in stores. And the younger kids, my grandfather and his younger brother, enter the professions. Um, so what I hope we can do today is reassess some immigration myths. Is it really true that there's an unprecedented flood of immigration today? And the answer is no. We've been here before. <laughs> did, did the Ellis Island generation rise quickly like rags to riches and immigrants today are not as successful in moving up? The answer is no. And we see this from my family, but we also see this when we scale up. Um, and are immigrant families and their children today stuck in a permanent underclass? And of course, the answer again is no. So just quickly to lay the groundwork for discussing these myths, to start off with, are we in the midst of an unprecedented flood of immigration? Um, we can see here the long sweep of history, 150 years of immigrant entry into the country. And we see today that 14% of the population is foreign born. If you ask Americans on surveys, they'll tell you that we've never before had such large numbers of migrants. But of course, that's not true. We had 14% of the population foreign born 100 years ago. And in between, we see this immigration valley, this dip, which is policy driven with the border closing in the 1920s and bottoming out at 4% foreign born. Of course, these waves are very different. And I wanted to show you that the earlier wave of immigration, 1880s, 90s, 1900, are primarily immigrants from Europe. That's the yellow part of this graph. Whereas today, immigrants are coming from all over the world. So there are many reasons to ex expect that there might be a quite different path today for immigrants. The past doesn't necessarily have to repeat. And so when we end up finding that there is a common immigrant experience, it's really quite surprising. Uh, contrary to some of our own expectations and in going into the research. Um, so second myth, um, did the Ellis Island generation rise from rags to riches? This myth is wrong in two different ways, kind of interesting. First of all, a lot of the Ellis Island generation migrants were not arriving in rags. So what we're looking at here, the zero line would be earning the same amount as the US born. And if you see bars above the zero line, that means that you have immigrant groups earning more than the US born. And the black bars are recent arrivals. The white bars are after we follow these migrants for 30 years, you see immigrants from many Western European countries already earning more than the US born. So this would be the equivalent of the skilled engineers from India or China, from Japan, from Germany today. We also had many uh, immigrants arriving in poverty um, and poor arrivals did not move up to riches within one generation. So the black bars that are below the zero line, we see there's some progress by the time you get to 30 years out, but no one is converging to um, the earnings of the US born. Um, finally, our immigrant families stuck in a permanent underclass today. Um, what I'll show you is what happens to children of immigrants versus children of white U.S. born parents who are raised with similar resources, similar finances during childhood. And I'll show you patterns for the 25th percentile of the income distribution, but this pattern is the same if you look at the 35th or the 50th. Um, and what we're going to find is that the children of immigrants raised at the same point as the children of U.S. born achieve more economic mobility over their lifetime. So this is the picture for today. Um, each one of these dots, I know very hard to see the, uh, the legend, but the point is each one of these dots reflect children whose parents were born in a set of different setting countries. The purple dot way at the bottom are children whose parents are white and born in the US. And those kids raised at the 25th percentile reach around the 45th percentile in adulthood. On average, the children of immigrant parents reach the 51st percentile. And you can see the dispersion around that average with immigrant with kids uh, of immigrant parents from some sending countries reaching the 60th or 65th percentile, even though they're raised at the 25th. Same pattern in the past. These are kids from 1880 on the left-hand side, kids from 1910 on the right-hand side. The US dot, which is the purple dot, is always toward the bottom of the picture. And we see the children of immigrants rising. Um, so I think that's um, all that I have prepared for because I wanted to make sure that we have discussion. Um, Nikita has questions. I'm sure all of you have questions, and I wanted to leave most of my time for that. 
Thank you, Leah. I actually wanted to start with that graph and the idea of where do these myths come from and what consequences do these myths have, right? So we all live in the US, many of us are immigrants. So we hear the narrative of immigration, this unprecedented wave of new people. And also in a way you were telling us that that influences policy. So this tension between immigration patterns actually influencing the policy debate and then policy decisions in the mid 20th century influencing the ability of migrants to actually enter. So can you tell us a little bit more about some of those patterns and the underlying causes of how those two things talk to each other? So uh, I believe the crux of your question is where do these, where do these myths come from? Um, and starting with the myth of an unprecedented flood of migration, where did we get this myth? I think within the lifetime of everyone who's in the country today, what they have experienced is the rise from the bottom of the immigration valley. There are people who were kids in the 1960s, 1970s, um, and they looked around and saw 4% of the population foreign born. In many parts of the country, that meant very close to 0% foreign born. And now they look around and they see 14% foreign born or more, depending on where they live. And that seems like, a, a for some, to some people, a frightening or dramatic change. So we don't have anyone who's really, you know, who can, from their own life experience, reflect back on the 150 years. And I think we have a lot of um, amnesia about uh, how extensive migration was during the Ellis Island period. Um, we also have a lot of focus on what's going on at the southern border and discussion of the crisis at the southern border. Um, the numbers that we see regularly seem scary. Two million contact points at the southern border over the course of this year to date were only in September. Um, the contact points does not mean individuals. Sometimes there can be more than one or you know, up to 10, up to 15 contact points for a single individual, especially um, under COVID, under Title 42, um, but that number seems quite frightening as well and contributes to this sense of crisis. If you think about the other myths, the, um, the rags to riches idea, that's a myth that's actually very widely shared. I mean, there's almost nothing that we can agree upon in the US today, left to right. But one thing we can agree upon is that the Ellis Island generation was good. You hear President Trump talking about this when he talks about why don't we have more migrants from Norway? Um, and that's sort of harkening back to 100 years ago, saying the migrants were better back then. We also hear President Obama talking about this, not, um, in a, not in contrast to immigrants today, but just really holding up and valorizing immigrants of the past. Um, so this myth comes from our own families, you know, the selective memory of, I remember my grandfather, I don't remember my great grandfather. He's the one who struggled, didn't, you know, never really spoke English. Um, never moved up the occupational ladder, but I remember my grandfather who became a doctor, and that's the stories that we tell, is the stories of great success in our own families. Uh, we also hear this myth in high school. Um, there are many cases that were pulled out from the records selectively, anecdotal cases of people who came with nothing and, you know, eventually became CEOs, and we often hear this very Whiggish history in high school as well. Yeah, and I think definitely the story of the American dream, I think, means something different when we tell it to each other and what we actually see. So zooming into this rags to riches story where you differentiate between, it's not really first the immigrants who come to America who experience this immense and quick ladder of growth, but it's the their children. What does the American dream mean to us just in general? And then how do we understand the American dream for immigrants? Well, I think the use of the term American dream is, is very contentious. Um, we uh, perceive our book as teaching us that the American dream is not dead. It's just as alive today as it was 100 years ago. Um, and uh, that it yeah, we can understand it as the idea of moving to the country to provide better opportunities for our children, even if we as the immigrant generation um, might have to sacrifice and suffer in order to do so. But other people have very different interpretations and meanings of what, what the American dream means. So um, while we do embrace that term in the book, um, and we do, I mean, if you've seen the, the, the cover image that I showed you on the very first slide, it has this very optimistic um, depiction of immigrants sort of in grayscale in the front, looking forward to what might be New York Harbor, and seeing a rainbow above the country. So there's a very op optimistic take that we embrace in the book 
At the same time, we recognize that the term American dream, you know, is very contentious, means different things to different people, and might be something we can, you know, discuss further if people have uh, particular views on that. Um, I'll just kind of follow up on a quick question. So uh, we are looking, your book, this book looks at immigration from outside the U.S., but a lot of your other work looks at internal migration. It's hard to study that, but we also see a lot of mobility happening even in that valley of immigration, the, the Twin Peaks. So how has your other research tried to understand how mobility and economic outcomes were reshaped in America? How did economic productive structures change? Is it about agglomerating people? Is it about where people live? What are some of the factors underpinning what we observed? Uh, well, one thing that's really interesting about um, our findings on the children of immigrants is uh, the underlying mechanisms behind that. You know, if you chat about this at the dinner party, people will tend to say, well, that's not surprising to me because I know immigrants work harder, they have a better work ethic, more persistent, and they care more about education. So people have in their mind a, a sense of immigrant values that they think would then lead their kids to succeed. What we found in the data is that there's another aspect of being an immigrant that matters a lot and can explain almost everything that we find in the past and is still an important contributing factor today. And that is where immigrants choose to settle. Immigrants move to the parts of the country that are the most dynamic and provide the most pathway for upward mobility to anyone. So what that means is if you compare an immigrant family to a U.S. born family living next door, the children actually don't do any better in the immigrant household. What, how immigrants do better on average is that they tend to find themselves in those places um, that provide upward mobility for all. In the past, it's quite simple. Immigrants avoided the U.S. South almost completely. So at the time that 14% of the country was foreign born, only 2% of the population in the South was foreign born. And the South was an agricultural region, primarily cotton growing, did not provide good upward mobility for either white or black Americans. But even if you're looking outside the South, immigrants went to particular states and cities that had a lot of upward momentum, industrial jobs, and that provided pathways for their kids. Um, so when you think about um, what is that special about immigrants, it's that they've revealed themselves willing to leave home in order to seek opportunity. They've already broken family ties. They've already left their home country. And once they get to the US, then they end up seeking out places um, that are very dynamic. But there's a set of Americans, US born, who also do the same. And those are people who move across state lines. So if we look at US born parents who are living outside of their state of birth, their kids look much more similar on average to the children of immigrants. So really it's this willingness to move, crossing borders, matters a lot, but even internal migration um, matters as well. And how do we think about um, moving for economic goals, but then social integration? How do you create a sense of home in a new place, whether it's moving from Texas to Massachusetts or India to Boston? Yeah. Um, well, uh, a couple of things there. I mean, first, I didn't mention anything in the really short presentation about um, some findings in our book about cultural integration. So, you know, we're economists. We started out by looking at how are immigrants faring in the labor market, what, what's going on with their earnings. Um, but when we talked to people, they said, well, that's all very well and good. You know, immigrants move up in earnings, children, immigrant children, children of immigrants do well. But I don't know, are immigrants really ever becoming American? And it's hard to define what that means. Um, but um, there's a whole set of practices that we can observe in data um, that will give us some clues here. Um, so we looked at everything that we could that we could measure both in the past and the present. And that includes who do immigrants marry? What neighborhoods do they live in? Are they surrounded by other immigrants in their neighborhood or are they living in more integrated areas? Do they learn English? And what names do they give to their children? And along all of those dimensions, we see that immigrants do take steps to change their, the norms and behaviors as they live in the US. Um, and they start, they end up at the end of their life looking more like the US born than they do, um, than they did when they first arrived. So that's how we think about integration is it's a very uh, empirical question. Um, it, there's no uh, values placed upon it. It's not better necessarily to choose names that look, that look like the names of the US born. Um, but let's just watch and observe what immigrants do. And we see that immigrants do um, start to change their behaviors as they spend time in the US. 
and at the same pace now as they did in the past. So all of the, I mean, this is one of those cases where my priors were really changed. I thought, oh, in the Ellis Island period, there was a lot of pressure for conformity. Um, and also immigrants were coming from Europe, which is sort of more similar in cultural dimensions. So immigrants sort of became American very quickly in the past. They jettisoned their old languages. They, you know, told their kids, let's only speak English at home. And these days it's very different. Well, these days it's actually not that different in, in the data. Um, but there's another interesting part of Nikita's question, which is, um, uh, you know, I'm not sure, it's sort of like underneath the surface and I just wanted to, to mention it. Um, there's a, there, there can be trade-offs here um, where, uh, you know, for example, I mentioned um, immigrants moving out of neighborhoods with high foreign born share. That's not a mitigated good, you know, for immigrants who leave, um, what you know, what people would call enclave neighborhoods. Sometimes that um, comes along with earnings growth, but it also comes along with cultural loss. And so we were able to look at this in a really interesting way um, with one particular community. We were looking at Jewish immigrants who were moved out of the city of New York around 1900 to cities and towns all around the country through a volunteer self-help program to disperse the Jewish population. Many of those immigrants did very well leaving the enclave, but also many of those immigrants chose to move back to New York. And the immigrants that chose to move back to New York were different initially. They had more Jewish sounding first names, they had more Jewish sounding last names. So by at least that measure, we can see they were maybe more connected to the whole set of cultural and religious amenities that they would have received in a large immigrant area. And I really wanna just make sure that I emphasize that point as well, that you know, there's going to be an, an element of loss and trade-off um, when we see immigrants um, changing their behavior as they spend more time in the country. And I think that's a really interesting note of optimism that you present in the book, which is how much people actually integrate but then you say a point of not, not so much optimism is segregation of African-American communities or Mexican and Hispanic communities. Are there some lessons that you've learned about from a policy perspective? What can you do to facilitate it a little bit more to allow there to be some more convergence of that upward mobility for these left behind communities? Um, well, I was, I was thinking about this, you know, the connection between my first book and this book here, and you mentioned competition in the promised land. Um, one of my main insights in writing that and in, in getting started on the research that led to that book was that African Americans in the US are also an immigrant population. Um, so uh, in 1900, around 90% of African Americans lived in the South. By 1970, it was more like 50 50. And in order for that rebalancing to happen across regions, um, that represents the movement of millions of people. And so if we start to think of African Americans as an immigrant population, we can apply the same lens that we would use in thinking about uh, the various immigrant groups that I showed you on the slides. And in some ways, the African American migration uh, produced very similar results, and in some ways, it produced very different results. I would say that the first generation experienced a pretty similar pattern, where by leaving the South, those Black migrants who moved from South to North doubled their earnings. And that's the same as the uh, European migrants in the Ellis Island period, doubling their earnings by leaving Italy, by leaving Norway, um, and moving to the US. When African American migrants arrived in industrial cities in the North, they did not earn as much as the existing Black population. And there was convergence over the course of their lifetime. So it wasn't complete convergence, but there was movement in earnings for the first generation. What's really different, though, has been the experience of the second generation, the children of the great Black migrants. And I didn't realize this, how profound this was until the work of Alora Durenincourt, uh, my colleague at Princeton, who was able to look at the second generation, the children who are being raped, uh, who are born in the early 1980s in cities that had high or not as high inflows during the Great Black Migration period. And the children that were uh, part of that um, second generation 
um, who lived in high great black migration areas um, did not experience much upward mobility at all. So that's where the difference really lies. And you dig below the surface, it's the boys from that generation and not the girls that were really experiencing this damper on upward mobility. Now put that in touch with what we're finding in the dot plots that I was showing you. I showed you a dot plot for the sons. I call them the children of, but they were the sons of foreign born parents. We have a similar plot in the book for the daughters. And we see a very different pattern for um, the daughters of immigrants from the Caribbean, from majority black countries, than we do for the sons. It's quite similar to what Alora has found for the second generation of the great black migration. So here I'm starting to see some echoes. It's not true for all majority black countries. Um, we only have five uh, of those sending countries in our data due to uh, privacy restrictions. But for Nigeria and Dominican Republic, the sons are also doing very well. What I'm thinking about here are, are the data for Haiti, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago. There, the sons are the one exception to this rule that I told you that the children of immigrants outperform the children of white US born. The children from those from whose parents came from those countries, the sons, are around neck and neck with the white US born, but they're not outperforming. The daughters are doing spectacularly well. So there is an inter intersection here between race and gender. And it's showing up for whether your parents are foreign born um, or whether your parents are part of this internal migration wave from south to north. And I, you know, certainly there's some suggestive evidence in Alora's paper that it's incarceration and policing. How is the earnings of someone who's incarcerated measured in our data? If you're incarcerated, you're still in the data set, but, you're, but you have essentially zero earnings, and that's really pulling down the average. If we were able to take that group out, now I'm not saying we should because they're a meaningful part of the average, but if we were able to take that group out, my guess is that the sons from those three countries I mentioned, Jamaica, Trinidad, Tobago, and Haiti, would be up above the white US born. And so there is this, this um, over policing and incarceration in Caribbean neighborhoods, as well as in the neighborhoods of um, the you know, initial uh, great black migrants. Um, and that is something that primarily affects uh, the sons and not the daughters. And I'll ask one more question, then I know the audience has questions too. But so you've told us about how immigrants try so hard to come to the US, you sacrifice everything for your children, you really, really try to make it, and then people leave and go back home. So migrants return, and I think the book puts it, book puts it at about 25 to 30%. Why do people return home? How do we understand what they do when they return home? How can you amplify the positive benefits of return migrants? So we had just talked about how some people, um, some Jewish migrants were sent to cities and towns around the country and returned back to New York City. Part of what they were returning for is a sense of cultural and religious amenities in this, in this large Jewish enclave. So now magnify that by your home country versus the United States. Some people are returning home uh, because of the pull of their home country, but they're not moving to the US necessarily um, you know, out of some kind of misunderstanding or misimpression of what they'll find here. I think return migrants are often very strategic. They understand that by moving to the US, like I said, you can double your earnings. And today, actually, in many cases, more than double your earnings. So doubling your earnings was for the internal migration south to north that didn't face any mobility barriers, as well as for the Ellis Island period, where there were very few migration restrictions. Today, with so many migration restrictions, the return to migration is actually elevated. And you might even triple or quadruple your earnings. So imagine that in the long run, you do want to live in your home country, but you know that there's this opportunity to move to a place, maybe for three to five years, earn a lot. If you come home, you end up leapfrogging over some of the people from your, from your uh, local area that did not leave. You can use the money that you've saved up to buy land. You can use it to build a house. You can use it to start a business. You can import some of the knowledge that you have, um, that you've uh, accumulated and acquired here in the US um, as well back to the home country. Um, so we actually have seen this in the case of the Princeton area, we have a large Guatemalan community and there, were, there was a, um, a 
a guy who went through, uh, through um, our public schools, Princeton High School. And while he was at Princeton High School, he was working at the local pizzeria. And he learned about um, brick oven pizza. Um, uh, and he brought and imported some ovens from New Jersey back to Guatemala. And he started the first brick oven pizzeria um, in his home country, and it spread throughout the country. And so that's the kind of local knowledge that you might get. And I'm not only talking about, you know, the science technology, like the high skill, um, you might be able to import uh, local knowledge across and many industries. So people come to gain knowledge, also to gain savings and intentionally go home. Uh, that's not everyone. Some people return because of unemployment shocks, health shocks, family, um, unexpected events um, where they need to return. But for many people, return migration is part of a strategy and really has always been um, around 25% return migration in Ellis Island period and around 25% today. Uh, I think we'll take a few questions. Uh, maybe, Fernanda, if you can have her hand the mic to people. And as you're doing that, I, what I really love about this book is how it talks between data and these stories. So people, the average story, not the Elon Musk. Um, I think there's a question over here first, at the back, over here, second room. Uh, just your name and your um, Hi, my name is Carissa. So I'm wondering if you managed to identify whether the upward economic mobility um, and differentiate between job maker and job taker, because there's a notion, right, that immigrants are taking American jobs. And I'm, I'm wondering whether it's true um, you know, by, by looking at if it's job maker or job taker, thanks. I mean, this is an enormous question. Um, so I, I could go on at length. Um, I want to make sure we have time for everyone else. But um, it's, I think, very hard to differentiate and put a label on someone as a maker or a job maker or taker. Um, certainly, we have this sense of high-skilled immigrants are, are creating jobs for others by opening businesses, by patenting, and invention in science, uh, and that's one thing. Um, but we also have, um, for um, low-skilled immigrants, all sorts of ways in which lower-skilled immigrants are contributing to job creation and expansion of industries. So I'll give you a couple examples. One is... Um, Markets that just simply wouldn't exist if we didn't have immigrants here um, working in those areas. Um, people often say, well, if, the, if immigrants weren't here, then the wages would rise and U.S. born would take the job and we would just continue as, as always. Well, think about how this works in agriculture, for example. Um, in the 1960s, we had a strong guest worker program with Mexico called the Bracero Program. President Johnson ended it and his thought was, well, if we don't have the Bracero workers, then we'll have to, um, agricultural jobs for U.S. born. Um, so um, pay was around a um, dollar an hour at the time, um, and farmers started to raise pay a little, a dollar twenty-five. U.S. born workers still did not come to the fields. And so farmers decided, well, at that pay, $1.25, it might be worthwhile for me instead to invest in new machinery to, um, to harvest, or I'll simply shut down the production of these crops that have to be um, tended by hand, and instead I'll shift into crops that can be um, harvested by machine. So that market, the market for strawberries, asparagus, um, microgreens, avocados, those um, you know, fruits that we and vegetables that we enjoy today um, dried up. And the types of fruits and vegetables that we had in the late 60s, early 70s were the types that you could easily harvest by machine. So that industry just simply shut down and shifted um, away from hand harvested fruits and vegetables. Think about what would happen if we didn't have immigrants entering um, uh, in hair salons and manicuring. We would simply paint our nails at home. And that is what I used to do. I mean, I'm like a child of the 70s. We didn't have, um, we only had iceberg lettuce and frozen fruits and vegetables. We painted our nails at home. And the idea that you would go and like get a manicure was just like something that only the very rich would do. Um, and now it's, a, a, it's an enormous industry um, that's available to many people. And so that is the kind of job creation for others that even lower skilled immigrants um, can provide by creating markets that simply were not there. Um, think about childcare. Many many people would have to pull out of 
um, the 4K uh, market work in order to care for their own kids full time. And with childcare, we now have an expansion of job opportunities for others. You can question from the side. Uh, maybe in the front here. Uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. I know I know when the mic's on. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, my name is Carol. Let me take off my mask and maybe it's a little bit better. So one of my questions was around um, using civic engagement as a key indicator of integration as well. Um, there's sometimes a notion that immigrants don't like to get involved in civic life. Um, but I actually used to work for the city of Boston and we run a civic academy for immigrants and we always got applications for it, right? So I'm just really curious to see if you've used that as a key indicator of integration, you know, around the country as well. That's a great idea. Um, I have not. And uh, Nikita was also asking me a little bit about immigrants and patriotism. And at first I thought to myself, well, it's really hard for us to, to measure some, such a thing in the past and today. Today, we have really good surveys, surveys of trust in institutions and attitudes towards American ideals. And immigrants score higher than the U.S. born on all of those elements. So immigrants are more patriotic Americans than U.S. born today. But I have no idea how this, what this would have looked like in the past if you don't go back and do attitudinal surveys. But then I was thinking about it in more detail, and I was like, well, come on. I mean, we can look at um, reg registering an enlistment um, for World War I, World War II. Um, we can look at registering as a voter. Um, and that's something that I actually supervised a senior thesis for someone who was working on um, with CPS vote, uh, voter uh, supplement on um, both Asian American and Hispanic American voter registration. Um, so there's a lot that we could have done and we didn't do, but I think that's a great idea. Hi, Kate Tanner, who tried the growth lab. And I was wondering, do immigrants who come to the U.S. as children, do they look more like first generation immigrants or second generation? Um, so, so that is a really good question. Um, the um, 1.5 generation are included um, as children of immigrants in our data. Um, and so they're contributing to the numbers that we see. Um, so um, if you break them out of, in the data, they sort of look halfway between um, the, the first generation and the second, but they are included in our social mobility numbers. Um, there uh, tends to be, um, sort of a arrival age cutoff um, after which the uh, first, the 1.5 generation looks more like the first generation. So um, they do face more barriers and that tends to be at around like 12 years old. Um, and so it has to do with uh, learning English fluently um, and spending more time in American uh, schools and public schools. Um, and so they, you can think of them as sort of in between. Um, so if you're interested in what the mo social mobility of the second generation purely, like people who are born in the country, um, then you would have to strip those folks out. And my guess is that what we would find would look even more startling in terms of upward mobility. Uh, Ricardo? Hey, hey, thank you for, for the book and for a great presentation. Two, two questions. You mentioned that um, part of the reasons why immigrants do better is that they select more dynamic places. Uh, uh, but I was wondering, okay, but then if they add to the diversity of the place where where would there be reverse causality, et cetera, and, and, or some self-sustaining mm -hmm. process that if you've looked uh, at all into that. And, and the second one is, I, 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 after I read your book, I saw another book on immigration coming with uh, a little bit of the idea that you know, immigrants bring a lot of, uh, uh, I don't know what to call it, uh, native traits and so on. <laughs> that uh, with it. And, um, and I, I mean, that has been used by, in some papers by Raquel Fernandez and others on, on you know, attitudes towards fertility or marriage or whatever that, that, that come with uh, 
immigration. And I can guess that, you know, when the Irish and the Italians and the Poles came to the US, uh, they, they thought that all Catholics were drunks and uh, it imposed uh, restrictions on alcohol and whatever. So, so I was wondering <clears throat> what can you say about this concern about the, the you know, values being transformed or affected mm -hmm. and or the social mm -hmm. norms being uh, you know, challenged? Yeah. Um, so on the first question, um, I, I think you're probably undoubtedly right that if there weren't immigrants in those places, then those places wouldn't look as dynamic as they do um, in terms of the density of industrial jobs, let's say in 1910 or 20. Um, there's some decision on the part of firms where to locate, and they're going to locate in places where they have access to um, a, a strong and robust labor force. Uh, so what we're saying here is purely descriptive. Just in a, in a very mechanical sense, once we account for geography, the advantages that we see for the second generation children dissipate. And think of it just as I described that if you compare the next door neighbors, we don't see this immigrant advantage anymore. Um, but um, the, it, it, it's, um, it's certainly possible that one of the elements that makes those markets um, more advantageous is because they have immigrants in them. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm not get sure. The benefit, get the benefit of whatever entrepreneurial spirit or whatever. Yes, it could be. Um, so uh, Dylan Connor and um, Michael Stolper have a paper at PNAS a couple of years ago where they tried to understand in the past what makes a market uh, more dynamic, what makes for upward mobility. Um, and they basically do a horse race between um, public schooling and industrial jobs. And in the past, at least, industrial jobs mattered a lot more. And interestingly, the children of immigrants that we're looking at in the past have fewer years of education than the children of the U.S. born raised at the same point in the income distribution, despite earning more. So they're earning more, even though they're at some kind of educational disadvantage. So they're in markets that had a lot of industrial and manufacturing job opportunities. And therefore, if you're thinking about what's the opportunity cost of staying in school for an extra year, I'm losing out on the possibility of starting work. Um, so people tended to leave school a little bit earlier. And in fact, it was in some of these more rural areas where public schooling really began and took off at sort of the work of Claudia Golden and Larry Katz. Uh, so at least historically, these areas were not necessarily the places with good public schooling, um, and they were instead places of with really industrial powerhouses, possibly also with immigration and the diversity of the place contributing to that advantage. Um, on the second question about bringing negative traits, um, whatever the trait might be, that trait disappears very quickly. Um, in, and so it, it's not entirely clear uh, from the question or the, or the work that you're citing, like which traits people have in mind. But whatever it is, we see that immigrants erase around half of the gap between their own behaviors and the behaviors of the US born in the first generation. And by the second generation, those gaps are almost entirely closed, um, if not entirely. So there are these papers by Raquel Fernandez and others that show that there is some long-term vestige of the country that your parents came from. And it's a long-term vestige in terms of you can pick up a, a statistically significant effect of where your parents had been born, but it's not important in an R squared sense. It doesn't explain very much of the difference between behaviors uh, according to where your parents were raised. So if you have enough data, you can certainly pick up this association, um, whether it's women's labor force participation or fertility behaviors or, or what have you. There are some immigrants coming from countries where women are less likely to work, where it's expected that you'd have five or six children instead of you know, two children. And you can see, pick up vestiges of this in the second generation, but it doesn't explain very much. The overall pattern is really one of convergence. And I think, and we'll go to Alexia, I think that it's also interesting because 
I mean, for people talk about we should only allow high skilled workers or and say no to all the asylum seekers. A lot of your findings are about it actually doesn't matter because you see an aggregate all of them kind of converging to this uh, integration, upward mobility, and really just positive spillovers. I want to say one big thing on that, which is there was a a really truly excellent piece, very much engaging with the the ideas and streets of gold. Uh, by Rehan Salam that just came out in Foreign Policy magazine. I don't know if you guys know Rehan. Um, he's the president of the Manhattan Institute. He's often on Fox News. We don't agree on everything. But there's a lot of scope for overlap and places of agreement. Where we disagreed was really on this question of um, how selective immigration uh, should be. And the way I see it, it's a question of how many um, slots we have available. Right now we have 700,000 visa slots and around a million if you count direct spouses that come in without um, being part of that quota. So around a million entrants a year. Sure, if we cut that number to 100,000, I don't think we should, but if we did, and that's what happened during the 1920s border closure, maybe we would want to prioritize those slots to the scientists and engineers who contribute a lot in terms of economic growth in the first generation. But if we have a million slots, or if we have a million 300,000 slots, which is what some um, uh, think tanks in DC are suggesting we need to keep up with um, the demographics and the slowing down of population growth, you know, like adding 300,000 slots, we're not talking something incredibly dramatic here, but if we're talking about 1.3 million slots, well, then let's think about what the labor market needs are currently. Do we need agricultural workers? Do we need ch childcare? Do we need elder care, construction? Do we need other personal services? There are many ways in which immigrants who did not get a chance to even go to high school or did not get a chance to finish high school in their home country, many ways that they contribute to the economy today and then what we're adding in Streets of Gold is to say that their children are not always going to be doing the same jobs, same occupations as their parents. The children have the opportunity once they are educated in the US and fluent in English to move up above the median. Thank you very much. Um, I have a follow-up question on the discussion that we just had with Ricardo also on cultural assimilation. Um, so following what you explained earlier about how migrants select into more dynamic communities and how that's kind of something observed over time, I would expect that these communities culture also assimilates more to an international culture in a way, right? So that the effect isn't necessarily only driven from migrants assimilating to Americans, but the Americans becoming more international in a way, right? And so along these lines, I wonder if there is like some observed pattern of polarization, cultural polarization, where on the one hand, you'd have this, you know, culturally diverse environments where people, you know, immigrants move to and then kind of the opposite. I think that's very profound and that's um, undoubtedly going on. Um, we do talk about it around the edges in Streets of Gold, about the different contributions that immigrants make. It's not just economic contributions. It's also bringing their foods, their music, different aspects of their culture with them. And the opportunity to live in a state like New Jersey, where I live, which is one of the most immigrant dense states in, in the country, uh, you know, to me, it's a really incredible set of opportunities for cultural exchange. Um, and that's a preference that I hold, but not everybody holds. And so there may be continued sorting along those lines, geographic sorting, or even if you all live in the same rough area, there might be kind of cultural sorting where you go to different churches, where you go to different restaurants. Um, and I think that that's like, seems like it's certainly going on at, at an anecdotal level. Um, but I think it's something that would be great to get a handle on and measure and, and, um, and have some ways of getting at it quantitatively. The way that we talk about it, and I think that makes sense to me, is that assimilation is a two-way street. You know, that immigrants change to become Americans, but Amer US born also change um, when immigrants arrive. Mohamed Gilly, my most said from the ground. So I have a question about the difference between economic migrants versus the forced, forced migrants or migrants that are due to institutional reasons and other reasons. Like, do you see a uh, success, like, because it lowers the barrier of migration if you have, if you're in the latter group? So do you see any success uh, change? So are you talking about refugees? And refugees. Yeah, right, right. Um, 
So, I mean, this has been really fascinating. There's good work done on refugee population in the US and also around the world in the modern data. But no one had ever gone back to think about people who would be classified as refugees 100 years ago. Our refugee system was established in 1980. Before that, we had some refugee acts that designated particular populations as refugees going back to 1948. But before that, we had no refugee system. Yet there were many immigrants from Europe who arrived due, due to a flight from persecution. Um, so we wanted to look at that group as well. And we were able to do this um, using some oral histories uh, of immigrants who arrived um, between 1890 and 1950. Um, and we found that um, these immigrants classified as refugees by us, according to the stories that they told for their reason for moving, um, were um, assimilating more fully into US society as measured by their details of their ability to speak English. We had one hour speech of these folks, like that was we had an audio tape, we could classify their accent, we had a transcript, we could classify their vocabulary. Um, and we found that refugee immigrants were more successful at integrating. And if you think about the economic explanations for this, it makes a lot of sense. If you have no expectation that you'll be able to go home, we talked about the 25% return migrants, then you have a stronger incentive to start investing in learning English, embedding yourself into labor market networks, social networks. We also looked at this um, it, today for the modern data with using the new immigrant survey, and we see the same pattern. Other people have done the, um, similar work on refugees in the modern data and find that refugees might start out with an earnings gap, but they move up very quickly. Uh, and so I think all the evidence is starting to line up that um, immigrants who feel like they have no home to go back to are those that actually assimilate the fastest. I want to be mindful of time, so can I do it if we go for a couple more questions? Sure. And if people have to leave, I know you may have class or, you know, so. We'll take um, maybe two questions that come on and be at the back. Thank you. Thank you for the talk and, uh, and for the very nice uh, Q&A session. Uh, my question is related to uh, what used to work in the past that may or may not be working today. Um, and and I, I can think of several just, you know, listening to you. Uh, one is um, the role that industrial employment has played in the past. Uh, if the factories now are either in China or uh, at least in Alabama and rural parts, and, and know that even domestically many factories have moved. How does the mechanics that uh, I, I was I was sort of guessing uh, or, or that you were hinting at, let's say, uh, how does that work today? And and then other things also that could go wrong or may have gone wrong already in my view are maybe because uh, of housing in these particularly dynamic places. And, and so as an immigrant, do you have access to these places today? And the third thing is maybe the cost of education. Um, if education is very expensive, uh, can that intergenerational mobility work, work as well as it, as it did in the past? I was wondering if you had explored some of those questions. Yeah, so we have limited ability to really answer those carefully because our historical data is incredible. We have millions of people, we know exactly where they're living, who are their neighbors, um, you know, we know their education level and their industry and their occupation. The modern data that I showed you comes from the Opportunity Insights Lab, and we were lucky enough to get aggregates uh, from them of how children who are raised at different points in the income distribution fare later in life according to their parents' um, and country of origin. But we do not have the micro data there, so we don't know education, we don't know occupation, we don't even know exactly where these folks are living. When we wanted to look at geography in the modern data, we turned to the GSS, which is a lot smaller and doesn't have good geography anyhow. Um, and we found that geography matters today, but not as much as it did in the past, which leaves a lot of scope for other explanations. Just because we see similar patterns of upward mobility doesn't mean that the mechanisms have to be exactly the same. In the past, geography was just overwhelmingly the factor that mattered. Today, it may not matter as much. But we still see that it does matter. And I think that housing markets are somewhat of a key here. The most productive areas in the country are now obscenely expensive to move to. And immigrants seem to have a comparative advantage at moving to these high expense places relative to the US born, in part because they're willing to live in smaller 
housing units and double up in part because they actually spend some of their budget back at home through remittances or saving to go home. And so they don't spend as much of their budget on the high cost of living location, whereas the US born are spending their money almost entirely locally. Uh, and so for these reasons, the immigrants are sort of have this edge of getting into the most productive places still today. Um, I, but I think there's probably going to be a lot more scope for education mattering in the modern data than it did in the past. And we just we'd love to be able to work with the micro data. Maybe one day we can or maybe that one day there'll be another source that will allow us to do that. I think I'm going to actually wrap it up. I'm so sorry if I get to those two questions. Maybe you can talk to Leah right after. Uh, if you haven't read the book or any of Leah's work, please go do that. Whenever I carry this book around, people stop me and ask me questions so you can be tested on what you learned today. But kind of reframing as a lot of countries are in political cycles, ideological battles on this very complex, multifaceted thing, where as you were saying, you might see similar trends, but the mechanisms can be very different. So there's a lot of things, to, I think, for us to dig into as future policymakers or people who help policymakers by doing research. Um, so I just really want to say thank you for starting the conversation here today, and hopefully we can bring you back to continue a very similar. Thank you, Nikita. Thank you to everyone for your questions. I really appreciate it.